California just passed four new laws. I count 18 rules definitely worth knowing in this video, and we're gonna start with the biggest one. Mercury, I'm door close clear. So in 2022, California passes four new laws that affect like 18 different rules about accessory dwelling units. Could be a big impact on your project. We're gonna go through my first read of the changes in this video. The big headline, as you could tell, is two-story ADUs statewide, but even that's complicated. There's three different height limits depending on the details of your project. We'll also talk about less obvious changes. There's some new financing options that are coming up. There's a sleeper hit. One of these bills doesn't actually use the phrase accessory dwelling unit, but it might have a big impact on accessory dwelling units. There's a lot to dig into. These laws are passed at the state level by the legislative branch, but then they're enforced by cities and counties and local agencies. And so there's a lot of difference between what gets passed and what gets enforced, and there are differences in interpretation. And we're gonna talk about what I expect to happen at the city level. This is my first read of these laws. The way they get implemented is gonna vary from place to place. If you have questions, pop them in the comments as you're watching the video. If you want, you can share this video with your architects, your designers, your builders, your city staff, because you know this is always a learning process as we figure out exactly what the state meant and how we can best implement those rules. Now, if you only take a few things away from this video, and the short version is statewide, there are rules that allow for two-story ADUs. There used to be this ability for cities to restrict ADUs to 16 feet in height, just across the board. That is no longer the case. Some cities already have more progressive ordinances that allow you to build above a garage or allow you to build to two stories. Those ordinances are still valid. But if an ordinance restricts you to 16 feet, there are multiple scenarios where you, that ordinance might become unenforceable, where you might be able to build taller than that now. There are also much clearer rules about what agencies are supposed to do within 60 days. So if you submit a permit application and it's complete, all the agencies that need to give you permits need to act within a certain amount of time. And if they don't, then you need to call me, you need to write to the HCD. Because they've clarified the law, it is much easier to understand what's supposed to happen now. That's a big change. One of my favorite parts is, is actually the sleeper bill that doesn't even mention ADUs by name. It's gonna allow you to convert your existing parts of your house into rooms without a public hearing. And that's not an ADU. It's just a sneaky other way to create room additions out of existing space. We'll talk about the detail and what it could mean. And then there's just like 18 changes. There's like lots of little things. Okay, first we're gonna talk about AB2211. Is that what it's called? AB2221. Very catchy names. This is a cleanup bill with a few little clarifications. Big thing in this bill is like, hey, permitting agencies. When somebody asks for an ADU permit, or JADU permit, y'all got 60 days. That was kind of in the law already, but it's much clearer now. And it used to say like the local agency, which is interpreted as like the city planning department in some ways. But now it says all y'all got 60 days. So it's changed the language to permitting agencies and it's added a definition to say, hey, if you're water district or some special corporation. It's not just the planning department and the building department. It's all these permitting agencies. They all have 60 days. All y'all got 60 days. Furthermore, when you say no, you got to say why you're saying no. You got to have a complete list of reasons. You, you can't give a partial list and then come back and have more things that were wrong with the original application. You got to give them all at once. You can still go multiple rounds because like the homeowner could change something and then that change comes back with another reason to deny. But like, it's it, every time, it's gotta be a complete list. If they come up with new things that were part of previous application, it's nay. At least that's my read of it, yeah? Okay, whenever the law talks about a detached ADU, that detached ADU can include a detached garage. Also, Front setbacks are finally explicitly written into the things that a city can't enforce if they would preclude the construction of an 800 square foot ADU. So if you're building an ADU and it's less than 800 square feet and the city tries to enforce a floor area requirement, an open space requirement, 
or now a front setback requirement. Any of these types of rules that would limit you to building either no ADU or an ADU smaller than 800 square feet, all of those are very difficult for the city or county to enforce because they're part of a statewide exemption ADU. Front setbacks weren't included in that before explicitly. Now they're explicitly listed. So side and rear yard setback of four feet and front setback cannot preclude the construction of an 800 square foot ADU. If you've watched a lot of these videos, you've probably gotten used to me saying a statewide exemption ADU is any ADU under 800 square feet with a four foot side and rear yard setback that is under 16 feet tall. The under 16 feet tall has been removed from that statewide exemption ADU clause and the height limits have been moved to a different part of the law. It's been nested differently. So let's talk about that because they then expanded on the height limits. So there's different height limits for different ADUs and let's dive into the detail. The city can impose a maximum height limit on your ADU, but that height limit has to allow you to build at least 16 feet tall, yeah? So the most restrictive height limit a city can put on you is 16 feet for your ADU. If you're building on a lot that has a single family dwelling or multifamily dwelling, and that lot is within half a mile walking distance from a major transit stop or a high quality transit corridor, then you can build up to 18 feet. And the difference between 16 feet and 18 feet is very big because in most jurisdictions, 18 feet lets you build a two-story ADU. 16 feet is just short. There's ways you could do it, like you could start below grade and stuff. But for the most part, 16 feet prevented you from building two-story ADUs. 18 feet lets you build two-story ADUs. So within half a mile walking distance of a public, major public transit stop or a large, uh, what's it called? Uh, or a high quality transit corridor, now you can build up to 18 feet, which is a two-story ADU. Additionally, if you've got a property with a multifamily dwelling that's already two stories, you can build up to 18 feet. So if you've got a multifamily dwelling on the property and it's already two stories, you can build a two-story ADU structure. And then the final category, if you're building an accessory dwelling unit attached to the primary dwelling, you can build up to 25 feet or use the underlying zoning code, whichever one's lower. So that's like if you're, if you're attaching an ADU to your house or your primary dwelling, it's a bump out, yeah? then the ADU can be as tall as 25 feet or as tall as the underlying zoning code allows if it's more restrictive than 25. So like sometimes, you know, uh, in Yontville near here, the underlying zoning code only allows you to build one-story houses, I'm pretty sure. So the if you did an attached ADU in Yontville, you, you would not be able to build above one story um, except if you're near a public transit corridor, maybe you could build up to 18 feet. That's confusing. This is a great example. We don't know how that's going to get enforced. If I know you, you've got questions. And please pop them in the comments because I'm going to be interviewing the people who helped write that legislation. And I'd love to ask them how they think about your questions. Now, very confusingly, we're going to go to AB, or is it SB? We're going to go to 897, whatever it's called, which is a different bill has a lot of overlap to the point where they needed to put a little clause in it that was like, if both get passed, pass this one first, and then this one amends the remainder, it's law. This is the other ADU cleanup bill. One, it defines objective standards much more clearly. So the definition of objective standards has been in the HCD's guidance for since December 2020 or September 2020, something like that. But now it's written into the government code which is great. There's also a change to prevent cities and counties from denying permits until existing non-conforming violations are brought up to code. So I've got a client who bought a duplex and he thought that was a legally permitted duplex when he bought it. Both units had tenants in it. He goes to apply for an ADU in the backyard and the city goes, whoa, that duplex up front is not permitted. That's existing non-conforming. You've got to bring that up to code before we'll give you the permit for the ADU. This law changes that and says the city can't do that as long as the existing non-conforming unit isn't a threat to health or isn't a danger to anybody, then actually they need to give the ADU permit. They can't delay it until the non-conforming issue gets fixed. Another rule changes that local agencies have to issue a demolition permit 
for a garage that's going to be replaced with an ADU. So this is kind of the classic, uh, somebody applies for an ADU permit and the city can't say no, but to get the ADU permit, first they have to demo the garage and the city says, oh, well, we don't have to give you the demolition permit for the garage. So that is no longer okay. This law also prohibits the requirement to post public notice or placards about the demolition permit. So when you build an ADU, generally speaking, you don't have to tell the whole neighborhood. There's no like neighbor notice, there's no placard. And some cities were cheekily making people post about the demo of the garage, of the existing structure, and that is now prohibited. The construction of an ADU no longer triggers a Group R occupancy change. Now it's a, we will look into it more as we learn more about these laws. If you build an ADU, that cannot trigger a requirement for fire sprinklers in the primary house. And like there are whole cities, uh, like I think Oakland and Berkeley both had like fire sprinkler requirements that could get triggered under certain circumstances. I don't actually know if that's about Berkeley and Oakland specifically, but it seems like it is. There are also broader, simpler, no parking requirements. So there were always a lot of protections in the ADU rules that said, hey, you can't require parking or you can't require replacement parking for ADUs and, and in some cases, JADUs. And those rules are getting broader, so there's even fewer situations where the city can require parking. This bill also has a section that's like, hey, when you say no, you got to say why you're saying no. It has to be a full list. This bill also has a thing that says, hey, when you build a JADU without a bathroom, it needs to be able to access the bathroom in the main house. Which, were people doing this? Were were people building day ADUs that didn't have access to any bathroom? That's weird. Don't do that. Like, even if it weren't a legal requirement, like, give, give people access to a bathroom. That's weird if you're not doing that. This bill also makes it easier to legalize a unit that was built before 2018. So if you have uh, what you would think is an ADU that was built before 2018 and it is not permitted yet. There's some changes that are amenable to your situation. And like I mentioned at the top, there, there's some funny things because this overlaps with a lot of the changes in the other cleanup bill. So it's like if both pass, pass the other one first and then this one. Um, but just procedural stuff. So those are the two cleanup bills. There's two more laws we're going to go through. But first, just if you were thinking about putting plans together, putting permits together, maybe getting quotes from builders, there's some links in the description below to our sponsor at Realm. Realm will help you get multiple bids from designers or builders. When you come from How to ADU, you get a free estimate of your property value with and without the ADU. Then if you decide to use their paid service to find a builder or to find a designer, you get $50 off your initial deposit, which is because you're coming from How to ADU. You're using the link in the description below. And I get a little something too, which is just awesome. It, it helps keep the channel free and it helps you get a budget for your project. So check it out. Now, the next law we're going to talk about is 916. AB 916 does not actually contain the phrase accessory dwelling unit. It used to, when it was initially pitched, it was about ADUs. But there was some controversy and some debate, as there always is, and they stripped out some parts, and they basically took out the ADU parts. There was some stuff about height, I think, but since that got worked into the other bills, it didn't need to be here. What is left of AB 916 is very short. It, unusually, it fits on one screen. Here it is. And uh, what's interesting is that I think this is a sleeper hit. I think that this has a lot of potential because what it does is it says... If you're converting an interior part of your house into a room, you don't need a public hearing. And there are lots of situations where I think that's useful. I, th I think it's universally more useful than ADUs in some ways uh, because it's a much lighter lift. And I can imagine a lot of people using it just to beef up their equity in their house. And then it's also interesting because there's a lot of fringe cases where I could see it being very useful. So, you know, uh, let's say you buy a two bedroom, two bathroom house and it's got an office or a dining room. And that dining room doesn't count as a bedroom on the listing. And when the appraiser comes, they don't count it as a bedroom. This law would say you could change that dining room into a bedroom and the city can't require public hearing. 
Now, can't require a public hearing to me means they can apply objective zoning standards, but they can't apply subjective zoning standards. And that's kind of interesting in and of itself, the, like the phrasing there. We'll go into more detail about why that's interesting in a future video. But for the most part, like that's who it's designed for. So if you're about to sell your house and you've got a big bonus room or an attic or something that you think it would be pretty easy to bring that up to code as a bedroom, you could bring it up to code as a bedroom and maybe change the value of your house. If you're looking to refinance or, or see how much equity you have in your house, that also involves an appraiser coming out. And I could imagine adding a bedroom to the bedroom count might have a significant impact on the appraisal of your house. So that's a, a use case that I think is exceptionally common. You know, a lot of houses have rooms that aren't bedrooms and a lot of appraisers will value your house differently if some of the square footage is an extra bedroom versus it's an office. So why, why is that amazing? I think it's amazing because it applies to tons of people, more people than ADUs, and it's not very expensive. It's pretty light lift, right? Like sometimes if you have a dining room that you want to convert into a bedroom, you know, maybe it's already got a big window and all it requires is adding like a closet and suddenly it's a bedroom. What a win. But I do have questions about this. I mean, one, so what about garages and unconditioned spaces? Can I convert those according to this rule? Like they're within the primary house. Can I convert them? And then two, without a public hearing, is that the same as you have to give me a ministerial non-discretionary permit with objective standards only? Like it's not the exact same language we use to protect ADU permits. I'm not familiar with this language of just like, oh, you can't require a public hearing. Just to illustrate how I think about these rules. Okay, so I can convert an interior part of my house to a bedroom without a public hearing. But let's say I'm converting an attic. And uh, to convert the attic into a bedroom, I need to add a big window for egress. And uh, the city has a rule that says I can't add a window that high up on my house. So at that point, can the city reject my bedroom addition just because it says, well, our objective zoning standards don't allow for the window. We don't need a public hearing to tell you that. Uh, and so it's not necessarily by right permits because they could still prohibit some of the actions you would need to bring that room up to code. So is this like a sneaky new way to say the city has to be objective and ministerial or does it mean something completely different? I'm learning at the same rate you guys are. So we'll, we'll find out together and I'll keep posting videos as I see how this rule is getting enforced, how this rule is getting used. Ooh, another example. I have a friend who bought a house in the East Bay and it was this giant house of like, I don't know, eight rooms, just a ridiculous number of rooms. And they weren't all bedrooms. The, the previous owner had done a flip, had converted a lot of space into rooms that looked and felt like bedrooms, but on the listing, they are not bedrooms. And so my friend could now convert some of these rooms into bedrooms and then get the house reappraised and it would have a different value. That's, that's really interesting. I have told my friend about this law. I promise you, I will personally be rec recommending this rule to a lot of my clients because a lot of clients are in situations that I think will be fixed by this rule. And so we're gonna try to use this and I'll tell you how it goes. And so 916 is a real sleeper hit in my mind. It's a very interesting law. I'm, I'm curious as to how it will actually get enforced. I'm curious about this public hearing requirement versus ministerial permits. Well, it's all, it's all Greek, right? It's all city planner. So I'll be watching this. If you're, if you're a city planner, actually, tell me what you think. Uh, heck, whoever you are, tell me what you think. Ask your questions in the comments. I will be keeping the channel up to date as I see this rule getting enforced in different ways around the state. Pop your questions in the comments and I'll answer those in future videos, which will be in this playlist with more up-to-date information as I learn about these laws. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not your mom, but I would love to build more housing in California. 